mine all sleeping, but I have strict instructions from VES that after eight minutes of elapsed of your talk, I will hold for five minutes to go silent, and then 12 minutes of elapsed, I hold it for one minute to go silent, and I'll probably stand up as well just to give you a minute. Because obviously we need to affect the quick transitions between the talks. Okay, that's what I need to say. So, our first speaker then is Alison Bennett, who will be talking about <coughs> growing up below ground the influence of drought on plants and their associations with soil organisms. Well, thank you all very much for coming to the very last session. Um, and it's a fantastic session. I'm really looking forward to the, the lineup of speakers, and that's not because I had anything at all to do with it. But, um, <laughs> I, I but anyway, um, <laughs> I um, <coughs> I'm going to talk to you today about some work that we've been doing out in Australia. Um, and this work is in large part in collaboration with my co-authors. This is uh, Colleen Debitra's PhD thesis work. Um, but it's done in collaboration with Jeff Powell, Ben Moore, and Scott Johnson. Um, and Scott got the funding for the long-term um, drought experiment that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, and uh, Ben does the chemical ecology. Scott does the low-ground root herbivores. And Jeff and I are the mycorrhizal people. Um, <clears throat> and so that's how it works out. And it's been a great experience. I'm going next. Can't, can't mess that up. So <laughs> um, drought is a increasing factor with climate change. We all know that as temperatures rise, so does um, the, and we see a reduction in water availability. And also the changes in the atmospheric pressure that is accompanied with that leads to changes in water availability as well. So this is an increasing challenge that we need to think about in um, grassland and agricultural systems in the future, <coughs> and generally in natural systems. And while we've been looking at this a lot above ground, we haven't been looking at the influence of low ground organisms on how drought, on drought tolerance in these kinds of systems or drought interactions. And there's two major types of organisms that are going to have a big impact on a plant's ability to tolerate drought and for whole systems to tolerate drought um, with in, uh, increasing climate change. The first of these is root herbivores, because root herbivores can increase that drought um, sense within a plant, so that by chewing off the ends of root tips, um, they actually cause plants to leak water and induce drought responses within host plants. Um, by contrast, our vascular mycorrhizal fungi are plant neutralists that have been shown to increase um, plant nutrient uptake, but along with that, they also increase water uptake um, through a number of mechanisms. And so these two organisms are kind of in contrast to each other. Their benefits um, and their, and their um, costs are in contrast to each other. So we out in Australia, where it's much easier to do drought experiments than in Scotland, where I currently live, um, <laughs> have been answering this very question. So we've been doing, we've been working at a long-term field experiment that I'm going to describe for you in just a little bit. And we've doing, been doing paired um, greenhouse experiments to try and understand the mechanisms of what's happening in the field experiment. So I'm just going to talk to you about two of those experiments today. Um, the first of these is a greenhouse experiment where we're interested in what are the above ground implications for changes in um, root herbivory and the presence of mycorrhizal fungi. We can't manipulate mycorrhizal fungi in the field, um, but we can manipulate them in the greenhouse so we can start to ask these kinds of questions. How does the presence or absence of mycorrhizal fungi um, in our droughted system influence um, feeding above ground? So the way that we address that is we grew Plantago lanceolata, which is one of our focal species. You'll see the rest of the focal species um, in just a bit <coughs> from these plots. It's present in all of the plots. And it's also one of my favorite plant species, so hey. Um, and we grow with and without mycorrhizal fungi to be extracted from the dry grass system, from the experimental field that we're working in, um, in the soil that these plants um, normally grow in. So this is an entirely co-adapted system, and we're just um, uh, putting in either mycorrhizal fungi or non-mycorrhizal fungi. And we subjected them to either droughted, um, droughted um, experiences or non-droughted. So we, we had an automatic watering system that manipulated the amount of water availability and that, that's what we call stage one. Stage two of the experiment happened <clears throat> about a week before I was expecting to come out and harvest the experiment. There was a long holiday in a four-day weekend in Australia. Everybody left town, and the watering system shut down on Friday, and no one discovered it until Tuesday morning. So we call this our extreme drought event. <laughs> <laughs> this 
extreme drought event had some pretty interesting um, results. Um, and so then after extreme drought, we let the plants recover for two weeks, and then we subjected them to um, feedings by snails to see if any of these factors influence how palatable um, the plants are for above-ground herbivory. So it's what's happening below ground having an influence on above-ground function. So what we found was that in stage one, the presence of mycorrhizal fungi was actually not a good thing because we saw a reduction in total leaf number, which is our proxy for total plant size on the y-axis here. And in the plants that were hosting mycorrhizal fungi versus the plants that didn't, um, these plants that had mycorrhizal fungi were smaller. So it suggests that in the system they're not actually really that beneficial. Um, however, once we had this extreme drought event, we saw a switch um, in that, that benefit. So along the y-axis, again, is number of live leaves, so the number of leaves that survived this drought event, the ability of the plant to essentially tolerate that drought event, depended upon whether or not they were hosting mycorrhizal fungi or not. So the mycorrhizal fungal plants this time are on the right. Um, <coughs> and they had a higher leaf um, number, live leaf number following this extreme drought event. And in this was, per this was in partly due to the fact that when they experienced drought, they had fewer leaves to begin with, so they just lost a smaller proportion of their leaves. Okay. Um, and then we looked at how palatable, how tasty these plants were for snails um, as our general sort of um, species to understand how, how toxic the plants might be. Um, and what we found was we looked at snail mass after feeding, so how much weight gain these snails gained by feeding on these plants we found that in the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, there was an increase in how much weight they gained, okay? so how good the plants were for these snails. But that disappeared um, in the presence of drought. And that's not the extreme drought event, that's the, the drought treatment um, beforehand. And this effect persisted despite the, the extreme drought event. So it strongly suggests that the mycorrhizal fungi in the system are having an influence above ground on palatability for snails and likely other herbivores. So let's move out into the field um, <coughs> where Colleen is working in our dry grass system. And we call it, it's called dry grass and it's, um, I think it's the largest replicated rainfall um, uh, manipulation experiment in the world. And the reason for that is that we have these sort of mini rain out shelters. Um, and uh, there's 60 of them and that allows us to have a large number of different treatments. Um, so this is a map of the site, and you can see there's um, 10 different treatments. We have two ambient levels of water availability, and we have a reduced level of water availability, so your typical drought, an increase of um, level of water availability, the light blue, and the post are um, water availability, or the seasonal water availability, is one of the things that's predicted in a lot of climate change models, the idea that you're gonna get the same amount of rainfall, but you're not gonna get it in the same pattern. So these plots are getting rainfall, um, the same amount of rainfall as the ambient plots, but they're getting it less frequently, so they're getting it post, essentially. Um, those squares that have pluses in them have root herbivores added to them, and those that don't, don't. And these plots are surrounded by um, three meter trenches to keep in the root herbivores and to prevent movement from passing in between. We also have an automated watering system that's measuring what's coming into the system naturally and then re-adding that to the plots underneath the, um, the rain shelters. Okay. Um, so what happened um, after three years of the experiment, which was last year, Colleen, um, we, we needed to sample the, whether or not the root, or test whether or not the root herbivores were still in the plots. So that meant that we needed to dig trenches along the side of each of the plots to assess that, and it gave Colleen a really good opportunity to look at what was happening in the roots of the plants. And now we've been looking across time at this by taking small cores, but here she was able to actually um, take whole plants out of the system and look to see what the treatment effects were. So she looked at four um, different plant species that come from four, from four different functional groups, um, a C3 grass, a C4 grass, a tap-rooted forb, and a fibrous-rooted forb, okay? Um, and she collected root samples from, um, from the root, root systems of these plants. She was able to remove the entire root system um, because we were digging those trenches. And she looked at the root traits 
And she also looks at the mycorrhizal community composition within the roots of these plants using a T. Rifflip analysis. And I'm not going to go into the details of that um, because I'm not a molecular biologist. That's why we have Colleen. Um, so, um, but if you want to know more about it, you can ask me later. Um, so, so then she was able to look at the community composition within the roots of each of these plants. And she found that pretty much everything we looked at had a predictive impact on what the community of mycorrhizae in the roots were. So lots and lots and lots of people have showed that the plant species that the roots, that mycorrhizal fungi are growing the roots of, influences the um, community, of, community of fungi. And that's what we saw here. So each of these four plant species had different communities of mycorrhizal fungi. And that's measured by looking at the dissimilarity um, of the fungal communities within the root system here on the y-axis um, from low to high. And she also found, in the, using the same metric, that water treatment had an influence on the communities of mycorrhizal fungi within the roots of these host plants. So we saw um, variation across the different treatments, the water treatments. Seasonal, again, is that pulse treatment increased um, if you're having flooding in your system. Um, altered um, is, uh, is the presence of the, the altered in the control should be very similar, I hope, um, <laughs> because they are the um, uh, ambient levels and then drought. Um, so these all had an influence on, um, on whether or not there were differences in the mycorrhizal fungal community. What she found was the largest predictor of mycorrhizal fungal community composition was the roots of these host plants. Um, each individual had a bigger impact than the plant species or any of our treatments. Um, so these are two of the SIPA plants, and even though they're growing in the same treatment, they have really different divergent mycorrhizal fungal communities. So what we saw is that there is an influence of, there is a plant microbe insect interaction influence in the system. Mycorrhizal fungi are, are influencing um, herbivores and interactions with herbivores, and the reverse is happening as well. Um, from the bottom up, AM fungi are influencing survival of, um, is influencing survival of host plants and influencing palatability. Um, but climate changes are altering the interaction between AM fungal communities, and this could have impacts on function. However, in our system, we're seeing this great variability that is due to individual variation. And this could be due to the fact that our system is still relatively new and it's kind of settling in, or it could be that the biggest predictor is individual plant variation on particularly in fungal communities. So lots and lots of people to thank, um, including Goran Lepicicki, who um, was our waterer um, and managed our watering system, and is sorry he went on holiday, um, and Sarah <laughs> and Kirk, who helped with our um, our insects and our slugs. Um, just some quick plugs. There, we have a plant microbe inter interactions cost action. Next meeting is in Slovenia. Um, I really welcome you to join that. And we have a PhD student looking at mycorrhizal fungi and nutrient dynamics at MSA. If you're interested in that, get in touch. Happy to be a person. Okay, so we do need to have time for a quick question. mycorrhizal fungi out there. Um, when I extract um, spores, and this is just looking at the spore diversity, I can get upwards of um, 20 morphotypes. Which, so it's one of the more diverse sites that we've, I've ever worked at personally in my career. Um, and so it could be that you've got this incredibly high diversity, um, and so that diversity we know happens to be patchy on a spatial scale. So it could be that you're, you know, what you're seeing is that, that high diversity as, as one, one potential factor, or it could be, like I said, it's just, you know, it's settling in, and, you know, the effects aren't, haven't been, hasn't been going on for long enough to, to really dive in and respond. So, those are my guesses, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, I think we'll have to leave there and get the next group on. Thank you very much.
thanks everyone for coming. Um, um, I'm Erin, I'm supervised by Sue Hartley and Thorin Helgerson. You can follow all of us on Twitter, it's not exciting. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the role of Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and um, root symbionts in general on plant silicon and phosphorus uptake. So, we'll begin simply, this is a plant, um, and <laughs> just get does all on the same level, and plants take up nutrients through their roots, as we know. Um, this leads to um, the creation of a sort of depletion zone, which is... Um, troublesome for the plant because it has a finite number of resources and it can either um, allocate these resources to um, continuing to expand root growth which leads to um, a constant chase to uh, extend out this depletion zone or it can um, allocate resources to symbiotic root fungi to do the dirty work for it. And so these extend outside of the depletion zone and not only um, do they do that and can access more nutrients, the hyphae are very um, fine, finer than fine roots and so can access um, small pores that are inaccessible to the plants, thereby enabling them to access nutrients they wouldn't normally be able to. <clears throat> and so this um, enables them to take up important plant nutrients such as phosphorus. So the black bars here represent um, mycorrhizal treatments, but also um, silicon as well, which um, isn't an essential plant nutrient, but it's um, highly beneficial, uh, particularly in grasses, as a physical um, and chemical defense. So Having these uh, mycorrhizal communities has the potential to improve plant health, um, both through nutrition and defense as well. So um, to add another component to this system, we can add in micro, um, mycorrhizal diversity and different um, species and even um, within species, there's the um, different ability to take up nutrients. So at the top we have four different species of um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi and their ability to take up shoot, um, to improve shoot phosphorus uptake. Um, and this isn't related to hypha length, which I think is really interesting. It just sort of um, goes to show that certain um, species or um, uh, varieties within that species um, are perhaps more effective, uh, not related to their um, hypha length. Um, to add in another component to the system, these different um, mycorrhizal species will have different abilities to recruit um, uh, PGPR, or plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, for example. Um, and so this, this graph here shows the two at the bottom. Um, I don't know whether the laser is... No, oh, God, no. <laughs> um, is that on this one? <laughs> yeah, okay, here. So we, um, this treatment at the bottom is non-mycorrhizal plants, and then uh, the y-axis is just saying the chemotaxic response. So this is how the um, uh, plant is able to recruit different um, types of bacteria. So for the mycorrhizal plants, you can see that the recruitment is higher. Um, so overall, we have this sort of um, different levels of complexity of these systems. And um, it's fairly easy to replicate the top, um, the first two um, in this um, in glasshouse experiments, for example. We've, it's really important to understand all the different levels of this um, system to help us understand how these um, symbiotic microbes can improve plant health. But replicating these two latter ones can be a bit difficult, as you saw with the diversity of um, the microbes. Um, having just one or two species in combination um, is, is tricky to un have a really full picture of, um, of plant health. So um, my work, I'm looking at um, how uh, mycorrhizal fungi uh, specifically, but also other um, symbiotic root fungi help plants take up phosphorus and silicon. So um, just to give a bit of context to that work, um, I'll present the results of a previous study that I presented in Edinburgh last year. So we're just looking at this um, small component where we have one um, single species in combination with a silicon enrichment and um, uh, controls of both that set up in a factorial design. And the question here is, do abascular mycorrhizal fungi have an effect on silicon uptake? And we were able to prove that um, different, um, so it, without, the, uh, without the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, um, the plants have uh, the ability to take up silica less efficiently. Um, so this is on the y-axis, just a measure of the efficiency of a per centimetre of root, um, which is similar to the graph that I showed at the beginning um, in the introduction. So the higher this value, the more efficient the root is at taking up um, mycorrhizal, uh, taking up the nutrient here, so silicon. So you can see that in combination with silicon enrichment, the um, plants were, had um, a more efficient uptake of silicon. So mycorrhizal fungi were having a benefit, essentially, um, more than just silicon addition alone. So this led us on to the next stage of the um, experiment which I'll present today, which is adding in ad additional microbial diversity. So um, we have the same two treatments here, a, a control and a single species um, inocular, but also some naturally derived inoculars rather than um, binding single species and having um, those represented. So we have a 
a, um, a field margin treatment, so a lay strip at the edge of an agricultural field, a pasture treatment, and um, a treatment um, from a woodland site which has a bracopodium um, cover, so hopefully some adapted communities in there because we're using a bracopodium as our um, plant species of choice. So to derive these um, natural linocula, we um, filtered out spores and um, added in live roots and um, a bacterial filter to control for the, the rhizosphere organisms. And the controls received um, uh, autoclaved roots and a water um, treatment um, instead in lieu of the spore addition. So this research question was building on the previous study I introduced and just looking at how microbial diversity impacts silicon and phosphosatic. And by using the natural inocula, we're hoping that we can um, improve uh, the sort of realisticness of this experiment. So um, we looked at total root colonization and we, um, this is just done by subsampling the roots and um, staining them using acid fusion and looking at them under a compound microscope. Um, and we can see that we do have um, colonization of um, AMF, and this differs significantly between treatments, as does the non-mycorrhizal um, colonization as well. So our single species um, inocula um, did have the highest amount of um, uh, colonization by AMF, but also a significant amount of non-AMF colonization as well. Um, so, and we were able to um, show some interesting differences between the two, um, between the several different inocular treatments. Um, so we're interested in how this relates to um, the uptake of silicon and phosphorus. So you can see that hopefully ones which are colonized to a similar level maybe have similar uptake of, um, of silicon and phosphorus, but we didn't find that to be true. So the two that were similarly related on the previous slide, pasture and um, uh, the woodland species one, have um, very significantly different um, uh, levels of uptake. Uh, and the, um, differences are significant across the two. So this is phosphorus uptake efficiency on the left and silicon uptake efficiency on the right. Um, so I think it's interesting is that I've sort of presented the total root length colonized um, data in the previous slide, and that doesn't seem to be very predictive of what's actually happening in the roots, which maybe suggests that um, the diversity in the, the, the um, fungi that are present in, um, in the roots have a larger uh, role to play, like I introduced in the um, introduction that different species have different um, uh, capabilities of improving nutrient uptake, for example. So uh, to look at this in more detail, we did um, next generation ampicon sequencing. So um, just a brief overview of that for those of you who aren't familiar with this technology, we extract total root um, DNA and we amplify this through um, PCR, which is allegedly a simple process, but I think it really stands for pray, cry, repeat, because it takes a long time to optimize these kind of things. Um, so. To improve the yield of the two regions that we wish to identify, we amplify the long-range region of the internal transcribed spacer, which is the region for um, uh, used for fungal identification, and we amplify the AM1 region, um, which is um, excludes plant DNA and um, uh, it should be a bit more specific towards uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and then the ITS, which is the general um, fungal identifier, and then we put it through the MySeq machine, it's a very simple course. <laughs> and then we analyze it in time, and there's a bit more crying happening here because it's a very <laughs> steep learning curve for a non-coder um, to do. And so this, this um, it's of a group of Python packages that enables you to um, group together similar sequences into operational taxonomic units, and then you can um, use different um, uh, sequence databases to um, apply the um, taxonomic data. So this is um, just some results. Uh, this is just a small subsample of um, all of the samples that I have, so I've got 40 in total, and the rest are on their merry way to the MySeq as we speak, hopefully. Um, and so this is using the Mariam database, so um, Maria um, Opik, who's speaking right now, I think, in a different session, um, developed this database, and it's just AM sequences only. So you can see that a lot of the um, uh, sequences are coming up as unassigned, which is uninformative, but our single species um, inocula does actually have quite a lot of glomerulomycota in it, which is... Um, the group of Arbascular Microvisor Fungi, which is promising. Um, we can use um, the Silver database as well as an, uh, an alternative database, and again, you get a higher diversity, and I think this is quite um, difficult to, to take in, but if we group the OTUs um, by similarity uh, between the different treatments. We do have a significant effect on the, the small database that I have currently. Um, so that's promising, um, and we hope to unpick these um, trends a bit more. Um, looking at the ITS database, however, um, there's a lot more diversity. I've got a few more samples on this one. Um, and 
what you can see, there's a lot of pink on this graph, which is unfortunately a glass house and contamination, I think. So I think that just goes to prove, as I said at the very beginning, it's difficult to replicate um, these complex systems that we want to understand for plant health purposes in the glass house um, because there are some things you can't control for. And a lot of people, I think, don't report um, other colonization in their um, experimental pots. So a lot of it's attributed to, to um, um, mycorrhizal uh, fungi when it, maybe there's something else acting in there which is interesting. And this contamination maybe is the reason for this horrible graph where <laughs> nothing is significantly different and it all, uh, yeah, it's just uh, hideous. So um, I'm afraid I don't have anything exciting to tell you about the um, individual players that are responsible for the changes in nutrition that we saw in the plants, but um, I think what I can conclude at this stage until I have further data is that um, the microbial communities are able to significantly alter plant silicon and phosphorus uptake, um, which is really important for plant defense and um, nutrition, and hopefully we can understand that a bit more when we see the key players in the um, system. Um, root length colonized may not be as much as a reliable measure as we thought it would be, um, especially if you're using a natural inocular where you have a really diverse system, um, because you want to be able to pick the key players rather than just having a combination of um, lab rat type um, um, mycorrhizal communities. And so, yes, glass house systems can be useful, and we need to use them to understand the finer details of the interactions, but um, it's good to report what's actually in your pot. And so building on this, I'm hoping to unpick the cost of agents and see how these compare to a real system. And I think there's a lot of asking what the fungus is doing for the plant, but not so much what the plant can do for the fungus, um, as JFK famously said. <laughs> um, so I hope that we can um, maybe move towards um, understanding what the fungi are up to as well as the plants. And so I'd like to thank um, everyone on the picture here <laughs> and the festive jumpers. <laughs> um, and <laughs> <laughs> um, and the British Mycological Society, uh, I got a small grant to come here, so I'd like to thank them as well. And so, yeah, thank you. I'll take any questions. Uh, I need to remind myself that before you ask your question, uh, the microphone needs to come to first. So, do we have any questions? There's one right behind you. Oh, and then see if hands are Hiya. Um, I was wondering if you could speculate what you thought silicon might be doing for the fungus or fungi in the um, light of your last point. Yes, I, I don't really know. There was a really large review that came out about silicon and, and one sort of throwaway sentence, they said that silicon antagonizes um, and doesn't go with mycorrhizal fungi, that, that silicon addition would decrease the mycorrhizal fungi colonization which um, I don't know if ne is necessarily the case. I think it's because silicon is, when it's having its chemical response in the plant, is meant to be negative against biotrophic pathogens, which as fungi are biotrophic, not pathogens, but symbionts, that maybe that would be decreasing them. Um, I don't know specifically what fungi would be doing for, or what silicon would be doing for the fungi, but um, because it's taken up through aquaporin transporters and that's the known mechanism for how they transport water, there's a potential flow um, that they might be taking up silicon. So I don't know. But that's what people should be asking. Because <laughs> fungi are important. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you to stand up for me. I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, you have looked at root length and uh, was wondering, I mean, of course, they are inside the root, but maybe if looking at the root surface area, mm. like specific root length, yeah, so would I be oops, more useful? Yes, I've looked at, so I, I skipped over this because I don't have a lot of information, but I used the WinRISO um, uh, software, software yeah, yeah, yeah. which gives you a, a heck of a lot of um, things. And the only thing that came out, I did a PCA on, on all the data I have, and the only thing that came out significant with relating to silicon was the, the root area, which wasn't correlated at all to the root length colonized or anything like that, even though there was quite a lot of variation within the samples. So that's something I hope to pick out when I actually have more data about the individual players in the system, because so, um, nutrient uptake, apart from being related to root area, wasn't related to any other of the root characteristics, really, in any sort of significant way. And the um, AMF, total root length colonization, and non-AMF wasn't related at all to any of the differences in, in root characteristics as far as I could tell, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. But I think there's promising stuff, and I have a lot of, of data that needs to be plowed through, and I think there might be something interesting there because, yeah, there are significant differences in root area, but between treatments, I can't really figure out what the 
where that's coming from, really, with regards to the treatments. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. Thanks. Okay, I think we've got it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Andrew Davis, who will be telling us about interspecific chemical differences in fungi producing different crops of kingdom outcomes. I will, honestly. Oh, it's a PDF, sorry. It's a PDF. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm glad to see that there are still some people here. I'm going to be talking about uh, the interactions between metazoans and microbes. In particular, I'm going to be talking about the interactions between insects and molds. I work at the Institute of Chemical Ecology in Jena in Germany, uh, but this work is carried out in collaboration with a group of biochemists, behaviorists, and entomologists at the uh, University of Göttingen Institute of Zoology and other faculties. And so I have their names up, up there. The essence of ecology is that it's about the interactions between species and between species and their environments. This is the famous definition that uh, Mike Began told us about earlier on in the conference. And we are accustomed to seeing these as complex diagrams like this. But this isn't the only level of complexity. There is even more complexity in the picture as well. This diagram happens to be a, a trophic network indicating who eats who. But the trophic interactions are not the only classification of interactions. There are many others and even as long ago as Darwin, this was recognized in his famous example of the effect of cats on the growth of grass. You can find this in his, uh, in his book, Origin of Species. And there are different categories of, of interactions. Now, in the saprophytic world that I'm investigating of decaying fruit, most of these interactions are mediated by biochemistry, whether they are functional, uh, whether they are um, uh, competitive interactions, trophic interactions, or facilitation interactions, they are biochemically mediated. We've already shown, for example, that uh, the presence of yeast in the microbial uh, community facilitates the use of molds as a foodstuff by uh, insects, in particular, Calembola and Drosophila larvae. In, uh, this, this shows on the left-hand side, without any, uh, without any molds present at all. Uh, the second column shows when uh, the mold is present on its own, and the two further columns show the effect, the rescue effect on Drosophila larvae of the presence of other microbes in the system. Moles in the system are throwing out a huge number of chemical compounds into the environment, and these chemical compounds include enzymes and uh, nutrients, but in addition they also include toxins. We're familiar with the toxicity of the macrosporophores, the big fungi, but the molds, although they are humble and often overlooked, are, are putting toxins out into the, into the environment as well as the uh, macrosporophores are. And the particular system we're working on here is Penicillium expansum and uh, Drosophila melanogaster larvae. And here's a picture of uh, Drosophila melanogaster larvae congregating around a colony of the mold. They congregate there because the mold is breaking down the substrate into uh, smaller chemicals, which the larvae can more easily ingest and digest. Penicillium expansum is a completely natural part of the community, 
uh, as I've already shown you, the, these uh, decaying fruit, the one in the foreground, is covered with Penicillium expansum. Penicillium expansum, however, comes in a number of varieties, and we chose three of these varieties which are morphologically different, and we analyzed their, uh, their metabolome, the different metabolic uh, compounds that they push out into the environment. And if you do that, you can uh, show that each of the morphotypes of the penicillium are producing a very different blend of chemical compounds. If you then, then go a step further and you damage these three different uh, morphotypes of the mold, each of them responds differently by uh, producing a different set of compounds or changed amounts of the compounds that they previously produced. So there is an induction effect of damage. And this is, uh, this is what we did in this uh, setup here. We exposed damaged and undamaged molds to uh, Drosophila larvae and recorded the behavior of the Drosophila larvae after uh, exposure to the different kinds of molds. Here is a, a two-way cluster diagram of the metabolome of the molds, showing that the three different strains of mold not only produce different uh, uh, groups of metabolites before damage, but they also respond differently to damage by producing different uh, combinations of uh, metabolites. Uh, I'm now going to show you uh, three slides showing the results of a me metabolomic analysis of these three strains after damage. And uh, in particular, you should look at what's happening to uh, PE220 and PE181. Uh, on the left-hand side, there is a, vol a volcano plot uh, that shows you the that shows you the, the compounds which are making the biggest contribution to the differences between clusters. And on the right-hand side is an MDA plot. And the further to the right the dots are, uh, the greater the combination of, of that, those compounds to the separation of the clusters that we saw earlier in the two-way clustering diagram. So this is uh, strain A, and that's where these two chemicals are. This is strain B, and in this case, only 220 is present in the volcano plot as a significant uh, compound. And this is strain C, and again, we've got these two compounds. So strain B is a particular, uh, particularly different from the other two. So what's this doing to the Drosophila behavior? And here's a plot showing the change in Drosophila uh, behavior over time. At the bottom is the process of mortality. At the top is the process of escape behavior. And you, there are significant effects of the metabolomes of the three strains and of the induction treatment uh, throughout on both these behavioral, comp uh, both, both these behavioral phenomena and in addition on other phenomena like total mortality and the fertility of surviving adults. We also looked at the effect of these compounds on the growth of other microbes. In particular, we looked at the effect of these compounds on the growth of uh, yeasts, taking two particular yeasts and looking at their growth rates when these uh, when these metabolites were present. And again, these metabol uh, metabolites have major effects on the growth rates of the yeasts. In particular, when the, uh, when the molds are induced, the growth rates of the yeasts are either uh, reduced or they are stopped completely. So the metabolites of the mold, the chemical fingerprint of the mold, is having a major effect on the entire saprophytic community, 
So it has, the metabolites have a big footprint. So how can we put these things together and analyze how the uh, fingerprint affects the ecological footprint? And what I've done is I have, uh, I have randomized, I have coded the comp, uh, I've coded the molds by their metabolomes, by their, their chemical spectra, and I've coded the behavior of the Drosophila and the yeasts. I've coded uh, all of those together, and I've conducted a randomized uh, matrix analysis, and the left-hand distribution is the distribution that you get when you randomize completely, and nicely enough, it's symmetrical about zero, so there is just what we'd expect. But if you randomize only within treatments, you find that all the uh, correlations are, uh, are uh, positive, and you also discover that uh, the majority of them are uh, significant. This means that the, that the differences in the uh, m uh, metabolic spectra of the molds is reflected in the extent of the way in which they influence the, the, uh, the entire uh, system in which they are uh, living. So we can then make these conclusions that strains have uh, different biochemical uh, responses to damage by insects. Mold insect and mold yeast interactions are differentially mediated by specific biochemistry. Metabolomic fingerprints have large ecological footprints. And therefore, because of these differences, you cannot, uh, you cannot judge or predict the mold insect or mold yeast interactions or uh, strengths or directions by any static feature of the pairwise interactions happening in the system. You cannot say that because this is a mold and this is a yeast, necessarily the interaction will be in one direction or one particular strength. And I'd just like to uh, acknowledge not only the team of people I work with, who I've already mentioned, but also the institutes that I work in, and my biochemical tutor, uh, John Dowria, now at uh, Texas Tech, and uh, for help with uh, randomization statistics, I'd like to thank uh, Kang Min Nung uh, of Tech, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan University. And of course, thank you for you all turning up and listening. Thank you. Do you think there could be fungal genotype level differences as well? I didn't catch you, sorry. Do you think there might be variations within the fungal species that you're looking at within different genotypes of one fungal species might cause different interactions as well? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at a single species but three different chemotypes within that species. And do you think if you looked at more you'd get even more variation in response if you increase the number of genotypes? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, we've looked at different species of molds, and we've looked at molds of different genera, as well as looking at variants within one species, as we're doing here with Penicillium expansum. And yes, there's a great deal of variety in the in the metab metabolomes of yeast of of yeasts and of molds just because they're molds and just because they're yeasts doesn't mean that they have the same effect on their environment. Okay, I think we better move on to the next speaker. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. So, our next speaker is Dominic Merges. Uh, he'll be talking about the effects of abiotic factors and fungal interactions on plant recruitment across elevational gradients.
Yeah, um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Dominic Merges. I'm from the Senckenberg Big F in Frankfurt in Germany. And my title slightly changed since we didn't end up doing as much in the time we had when we handed in the abstract as we actually thought. So the title now is um, Effects of Abiotic and Biotic Factors on Plant-Associated Fungi Across Environmental Gradients. Um, to start off, plant-fungal interactions can have many forms. Um, for example, mutualistic, um, that would be like, for example, mycorrhizal fungi, um, or antagonistic, which could be fungal pathogens, and uh, can be integral for plant nutrition, and nutrition, like the mycorrhizal fungi providing plants with minerals, or pathogenic fungi that can reduce plants' fitness. Um, in general, little is still known about the yeah, spatial patterns of these interactions and um, the interactions itself. Um, there are some nice studies in the past done on the effects of abiotic factors on plants associated um, fungi. For example, this study from Tidus et al, which linked soil parameters to fungal and plant species richness. Um, there are also other studies looking at temperature effects or competition and drawing from existing yeah, ecological frameworks like the janssen cornell hypothesis, um, recently distances to hosts were analyzed. For example, you can see in this plot from Leo et al. that we find um, yeah, higher seedling mortality close to mature plants when fungi are present. And if you apply fungicides, there is no difference in seedling survival. So clearly something is going on with fungal occurrence um, related to the distance to the host. Um, but as of right now, joint analysis of these, like all these factors are missing, and that's what the aim is in our study. Um, basically, to study all these effects together on the plant-associated fungi, and we use, therefore, um, environmental gradients um, we have a very nice study system to look into this. We use the Pinus zembra associated fungi. Pinus zembra is this beautiful alpine tree which forms the tree line in a harsh alpine environment. And it, it's um, associated with ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, which basically means in this environment, seedlings can't establish without the mycorrhizae, they will just die off. And the fitness is severely reduced by the snow fungus, a fungal pathogen, which eats up basically the needles of the pine and just leaves like these ugly skeletons of saplings back. And the beautiful thing of this system is also that the whole distributional range is confined to a very small altitudinal belt, which makes it for a great study system, since we can cover it in a project like the complete elevational distribution of the plant. Um, we use two valleys in Davos, Switzerland, which is in the Eastern Alps. And we sample basically the whole elevation, a gradient where the plant grows from 1,850 meters up to 2,150 meters. And we even go beyond up to 2,250 meters where no plant is growing anymore. Um, and we divided the two gradients into nine elevational belts and we sample every 50 meters in elevation in both valleys. Um, so what we actually did is first we sampled the roots of Pinus zembra to create a reference database for the mycorrhizal fungi. And then we further collected 288 soil samples in both valleys over the whole yeah, study sites. Then we collected the following environmental variables which were temperature, pH, soil moisture as abiotic variables, Erika shrub cover and canopy closure as biotic variables, and also the distance to the nearest mature pine trees. Um, yeah, the highlighted ones we could actually use in the models since they were not correlated. Um, then to actually get the fungal communities, we used the DNA meta barcoding approach, which is, which is this really cool new method or relatively new method where you basically take the soil, extract DNA. Um, we used then um, a standard PCR approach where we used the ITS 
uh, Amplicon, which is the official fungal barcode, which then is massively amplified in next generation sequencing platform, which generates millions of sequences, um, which we then compare to a reference database, which gives us operational taxon like a huge list of operational taxonomic units and their abundances. And we did it with the UNITE database, which is like um, the standard for fungi right now. Um, so we ended up with 6.5 million DNA sequences, which were clustered into 2,200 OTUs, which is an amazing yeah, starting point to work with, like a really cool data set. We then used the OTUs and clustered or like um, sorted them into 975 functional guilds. You can see that approximately half of the OTUs were actually saprotrophic fungi and one quarter were comprised of mycorrhizal fungi and plant pathogens. From this, we subsampled only the Pinozembra associated fungi. For the mycorrhizal fungi, we could use our root reference database, yeah, our root sample reference database. And for the pathogenic fungi, we relied on the literature. Um, so we ended up with this really nice community data set for mycorrhizal fungi. We found 38 species in nearly 80% of all samples um, which were associated with the pine. And we found one pine specialist in over half of the samples. Then for the pathogens, we ended up with 26 species OTUs and they were basically in all samples, which was already pretty surprising. And with then this one really like nasty guy who causes the pine to look like this in over one third of the samples. So then we started first to analyze actually how the Pinocembra associated fungi are distributed across the whole environmental gradient. Um, you can see here the abundance of the mycorrhizal fungi community on the um, y-axis against the elevation of the study plots. In blue you see the pine core distribution and as you can see there's no clear pattern. So we can find the mycorrhizal fungi which are associated with the pine like basically everywhere also above the pine's current range which is quite surprising. And we did the same analysis for the pathogenic community and we can see the exact same pattern. We find them basically everywhere. Um, the next step was actually to test like our environmental factors on the effect, um, if they have an effect on the communities. And we actually found on the communities no effect of temperature pH, the shrub cover or the distance to the host on the whole communities. But when we go down to a species level to the actually pine specific mycorrhizal fungi and pathogenic fungi, we can find um, effects of the distance to the host, which is pretty interesting. So we, demit we can't find any effects of temperature pH or shrub cover, but only the distance to the host seems to determine the abundance of the yeah, pine specific fungi. Here's the example for the mycorrhizal fungi, Rizopogon salubrosus. And you can see here the abundance against the distance to the host tree, which would be a mature pine, and it declines with increasing distance. And the same is true for Graminia infestans, the pine pathogen. The further you go away from the pine, the less abundant it is, and the abiotic factors don't play a role, or at least the ones we measured. <coughs> To summarize and conclude, the fungal communities were evenly distributed across the ele whole elevation and beyond of the, their host plant, which is quite interesting since this might have implications for the um, potential range shifts of the plant since plant species are expected to track the niche and move upwards with increasing temperature it's little known about mutualists are actually already present or will be there when the plant is supposed to shift upwards, but we clearly could find them on plots way above the current distribution, which is quite interesting. Then for the fungal communities to the environmental factors, we found idiosyncratic response 
But when you go down to the specialized on a, like a species level, we actually could find effects of the distance to the host plant only, but not the other abiotic factors, which is quite fascinating since it might imply some below ground Janssen Cornell effects where we actually might find higher seedling mortality close to mature pines. The funny thing is actually that we find the same pattern not only for the pathogens, which would be in the direction of the Janssen Cornell effects, but also for the ectomycorrhizal fungi. So somehow it might be that they compensate each other. Um, yeah, to, out, to outlook, we actually like at all the plots where we sampled soil, applied seeds and did germination or seed sowing experiments and we are monitoring the seedling survival to actually get to some cause and effect. Are the, yeah, are the fungi there because the trees are there or is it vice versa? Um, yeah, and this is still ongoing. Yeah, I have to thank many great people, the German Research Council, and um, I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Did you find the specific pine specific pathogens and mycorrhiza above the tree line? Yeah, yeah. we found them also everywhere but in lower abundance. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one in the middle. It's a good exercise. It is. It's very good. <laughs> uh, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, just to lead on from Sarah's question. Um, do you think the the pine specific fungi that you're finding above the tree line um, were active, or do you think they may have just been kind of passively dispersed spores that have just accumulated there? Yeah, I think like from the low abundances, like the low reed abundances, it might actually be just spores. Yeah, but it's also known that some like the more extreme the environment actually gets the more promiscuous these associations get. So it might also be that, I mean, it's not known in the literature says this one fungus is only associating with like five needle pines, but it also could be that it also is like in extreme conditions associated with other host plants. Okay, thanks. So <laughs> my question is, how do you know that the fungus that are above the tree level are indeed pinospecific or pathogen or beneficial, because so far you have provided evidence that, let's say, this is a, a phylogenetic marker, a small stretch of the ITS sequences. How confident are you on predicting the metabolic capabilities of the genome of those fungi based only on this, let's say, what kind of information are available at the moment? Because, for instance, for bacteria, this sometimes can be very problematic so you have a perfect match at the 16S level, and their genome may be, and the genome of pathogen and, and beneficial uh, uh, bacteria can be very different. Yeah, as you say, like in bacteria, it can be like really crazy, but like with the fungi, the ITS frequency is it's really good. Like actually, it's very well resolved for the specific ones we are looking at. So I'm quite confident in these results. So I'm a PhD student at Cardiff University, and this is some work that I've done in the last year with Amy Bettridge, who is an undergraduate student who spent a year on placement in our lab. Hey. So Amy and I are really interested in fungal migratory bacteria. And this is a group of bacteria. You can see one of them here. Here's the fungus growing out on the Petri dish, 
and the bacteria colonize the fungal hyphae and they track along them and follow them wherever they go. And the interesting thing is, is that these bacteria are doing it actively. Because fungal hyphae grow apically, unlike a plant root which moves through the soil, the hypha stays still and it simply gets longer. So for the bacteria to track along it, it has to be doing it under its own steam. And this has some obvious uh, advantages from the bacteria perspective. For example, fungi can cross air voids. Bacteria couldn't do that otherwise. But there's also other advantages. So it's been found if you have a low pH soil that the bacteria couldn't survive and multiply in on their own. If you inoculate them there with a fungus, then they survive, they increase, they track along the fungus. Same thing if you have a low nutrient medium that the bacteria can't exploit. Once the fungus is present, they do really well in it. That then raises the question what effect it has on the fungus. And uh, there's a couple of kind of contradictory lines of evidence as to whether it might be beneficial or not. So the bacteria actually upregulate their stress response when they're in combination with the fungus, which suggests there might be some kind of antibiosis or uh, antagonism going on. But then they also have the capability to benefit the fungus. So this was an experiment where the group um, inoculated an, anti, uh, an antifungal compound, cyclohexamide, in a band in front of a growing fungal hyphae. And when they met the uh, fungicide, they couldn't go any further. They stopped growing. When a tracking bacterium, Burkholderia terrae, was inoculated onto the fungus, it met the band of cyclohexamide and just kept going. So it was able to cross this barrier of toxins. So what Amy and I wondered is, well, what about cord-forming fungi? Because this is the group that the lab we're in particularly work on. So meet the cord formers. This is a specific subset of wood decay fungi, which form these aggregated mycelial structures called cords. And they use them to form huge networks across the forest floor, stretching for many meters, foraging and dispersing in this manner. So we wondered, well, is it possible that bacteria could track along them? Because if so, this would be a huge dispersal opportunity for the bacteria. The other interesting thing about cord formers is, and wood decay fungi more generally, is it's a group of organisms whose whole ecology and succession is shaped by competitive interactions. And when I say competitive, I mean direct confrontational interactions. Here you have Phanerichite velutina. It's met Hyphaloma fasciculare. They all have spent a while kind of sussing each other out and uh, a deadlock in between. And then Phanerichite has won this out interaction. It's coming into Hyphaloma's territory, it's lysing its mycelium. But we know that these interactions can be influenced by other organisms. So if invertebrates come in and they preferentially graze a competitively dominant fungus, it will allow a less competitive but grazing tolerant fungus to come in and win an interaction that it would otherwise have lost. So we wondered, well, could it be possible for bacteria to do the same? So we set out with a number of aims. Firstly, just to see, could we isolate these migratory bacteria in the UK, because most of the work that's been done on them is in the Netherlands, and could we get them from mycelial cords? Having got our bacteria, we wanted to test the breadth of their host range across a number of wood decay fungi, and flip it around to see what effect they had on the fungi themselves. Do they promote fungal growth? Do they decrease fungal growth? And really interestingly, what effect could they have on these fungus-fungus interactions? So we went out in the field and collected loads and loads of cord samples from Whitestone Wood, which is on the border between England and Wales. And Amy gave them a really good wash and sterile distilled water and then plated them onto agar. So here you have a bit of cord-forming fungus growing out from the section of cord on the agar. And what we're looking for is this distinctive pattern of bacteria following the hyphae as they grow out. And we did isolate a strain of bacteria in this way. So that was... Great, one aim down. It was not so great that it was only one, but we actually had a bit of luck and managed to get another two by accident, in that as part of another experiment, I was isolating chips of fungus-colonized wood onto agar, and in two instances, I found a tracking bacterium growing out as well. So we had three strains. And we put them through their paces by pairing them up with 10 species of wood decay fungi. So we have two early succession primary wood decay colonizers, three mid-succession secondary colonizers, and five late-succession tertiary colonizers. And these are the cord formers. And keep your eye on this one, 
Phanerokiti species W271, because this is the cord former that Amy managed to isolate the strain of tracking bacterium from, from the field. So very simply, we grew the fungi, inoculated bacteria on top of half of our replicates, and then measured the growth rate and the extent to which bacteria tracked along the fungus. And we did that at two different temperatures. So what did we find? Well, it was a real mixed bag of results, and I've picked out some of the more interesting ones to show you. So to start with Bizcogneoxia, this is one of our early decay fungi, and it showed a marked temperature response. So here you have the control without bacteria in blue, and then our three different bacterial strains. At 10 degrees, all three strains increase the growth rate of the fungus. 20 degrees, there's much less influence of the bacteria, but insofar as they do have an impact, they actually decrease growth. Compare that with our new Phanerokiti, which showed a marked and consistent decrease in growth rate with any of the bacteria treatments. Different again was Sterium hirsutum, and I think I could subtitle this talk, Sterium Doesn't Care, because across the whole of our experiments, apart from producing some rather pretty pigments, it showed no response to bacteria. And our final surprise uh, from this was I had two different strains of Hyphaloma fasciculare. So here, this top strain really doesn't show any response to the bacterial treatments, whereas this bottom strain shows an increase in growth rate for all the bacterial treatments. And there seems to be a very good have been a very good reason for this, which is the bacteria failed to colonize this top strain. So we inoculated them, but they never managed to establish on the hyphae. So that's quite a pronounced intraspecific difference in fungal response to bacteria. So moving on then to the competitive interactions. For this, we used a subset of five of those fungi, and we paired them together. So we inoculated two fungi onto agar, and for each set of interactions, we either had bacteria on competitor one, bacteria on competitor two, on both, or on neither. And you watch the progress of interactions, as here this fungus on the left is taking more and more territory until it's got the whole dish. We measured which one won, and how long it took them to get them there, get how long for it to, to, take to get there. And so what you have here is a combined metric of outcome and time. So this is the sterium. Uh, it's paired against each of its four competitors. And then it's, if you get a low negative score, that means that you lost quickly. A uh, less severe negative score means that you lost slowly. A small positive score is winning slowly. And a large positive score is winning quickly. Controls are in pink, blue is when the bacteria were on sterium, green on the competitor, purple on both, and once again, sterium doesn't care. It doesn't really show any noticeable response to bacteria in any of the competitive interactions. Compare that to Trometes, which I think was probably uh, quite typical of a lot of the results that we saw, and it's a real mixture. Sometimes it seems to do better with bacteria, sometimes it does a bit worse, by and large, you've got huge error bars, lots of variation, hard to pick out any pattern. One fungus that did show a clear pattern, though, was our new Phanerokiti, and it did badly. And it did particularly badly wherever it had the bacteria. So you can see these blue and purple bars are very much lower than the other treatments. And that effect was consistent at both 10 degrees and at 20 degrees. It really got on badly with these bacteria, and particularly strain two. So as one last piece of the puzzle, Amy and I did some confocal microscopy. And this was my favorite picture. I'm afraid it's a bit dark. Uh, but what you have here are hyphae that are coming together and just starting to aggregate into a cord. And at the point the cord is forming, you have this glowing mass of bacteria clinging to the hyphae. And what that suggests to me is that perhaps the bacteria aren't tracking on the outside of the cord, which is quite a tough, hostile environment, but maybe they're tracking along hyphae inside the cord which will be a nice, protected environment, uh, protected from the uh, external factors such as temperature, water, and that could be a really nice place for the bacteria to live. So in conclusion then, I think our results show that tracking bacteria at least have the potential to be common with wood decay fungi. They certainly seem to have a very broad host range and capability to migrate with the different fungal species but you get a huge amount of variation in the fungal response, and that happens both between and within fungal species. However, some fungi do definitely show a really negative response to these bacteria, and they seem to be badly affected by them. And there's a possibility that there's some kind of strain-specific aspect to this, in that 
the fungus that consistently did worse in combination with bacteria was the fungus that we found naturally associating with the tracking bacterium in the field. So maybe this is a strain that has a particular weakness for bacteria and isn't able to get rid of them, even if it wanted to. But as ever, there's a lot of unknowns left. I think really it raises many questions as it answers, and there's certainly an awful lot left to find out about these tracking bacteria and how they interact with fungi. So with that, I'll finish, and we'd just like to thank the Fungal Ecology Group at Cardiff, and particularly my two supervisors, Lynn and Andy, and Amy, who put in a fantastic amount of work on this project, and there's also Kai, who is continuing to do some work with these bacteria and fungi this year. So I'll leave you with a pretty picture of the bacteria tracking along a fungal hyphae and ask if you have any questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, to my knowledge, the group in the Netherlands you mentioned observed migratory bacteria uh, always moving in the growth direction of the fungus and predominantly at the hyphal tip. Right. Whereas other groups also observed migration in all directions and all over the fungal network. Could you comment on how this looked like in your experiment? Yeah, we did do a little bit of testing to see which direction they moved in, because initially when we did the experiments, it looked like there might be a bit of bidirectional movement. Um, but it seems that certainly, I think it was two of our three strains only showed movement towards hyphal tips. We observed a tiny bit of movement in some cases in the other direction, but it wasn't very much. So there does seem to be this strong preference to migrate towards the hyphal tips. One right in front. Hi, great talk. Um, do all fungi have uh, the potential to have these bacteria on them? And do you think mycorrhizal fungi might have them particularly? Uh, that's a really good question. I think. Um, from what I've read, certainly there's the potential. I can't think of... I'm trying to think if anyone's actually tested it on mycorrhizal fungi. But it's certainly been found on wood, wood decay fungi here, soil saprotrophs, plant pathogens. So I can't see any reason why it wouldn't hear on mycorrhizae as well. That would be something very interesting to find out. Just another question. Are there hydrophilic fungi uh, included in your selection of strains? Uh, this is, that was an interesting, um, an interesting one. So two of our fungi, um, Jacandra and Sterium, seem to be more hydrophobic in their mycelium. Now, we don't actually have any um, quantitative data on this. This is just simply sort of observational data, that their mycelium seems to be more hydrophobic than um, that of some of the other species. And it seemed to possibly be that the more hydrophobic the mycelium, the, the bacteria struggle to colonize it more. But that would fit in with some work that was done um, within the last couple of years, which found that aerial hyphae tend to be hydrophobic and bacteria can't migrate along them as well as submerged hyphae, which are more hydrophilic. And that would kind of make sense in that it seems likely that the bacteria are forming a biofilm. So a hydrophobic surface would be much harder for them to form a biofilm around. So thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the first, I need to say that I'm Spanish. I have a terrible English, so I'm sorry for you. But I'm going to explain the best I can this work. So, well, in this work, we want to test the effect on landscape and habitat degradation in Fififus lotus uh, population. Fififus lotus is a keystone scrub uh, from threatened European semi-arid habitat. Oh. What? Ah, OK. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Fififus lotus is a thorny sclerophyllous rub 
uh, with hermaphrodite flowers. The flowering occurs from May to July and the fruit ripening, it's mainly in September. Uh, Sisyphus has a southern Mediterranean and Sahara Arabian distribution and the semi-arid southern of Iberian Peninsula is a relic habitat. So this is the reason because this is a priority interest habitat and is catalogated uh, in the um, habitat directive uh, as arborescent scrubland of Sisyphus lotus. So what is the problem? Uh, and since the 60s, uh, the intensification of, of anthropogenic action, mainly greenhouse agriculture and urbanization, has provoked a severe population reduction. Actually, the population size uh, are from 10 to 1,000, depending on the land use of this area. So with this, this dramatic expense, um, we, did the, we did this question, how is the viability of continuity of population of Sisyphus being affected? Um, our objective is evaluate how large scale and local scale degradation are affecting plant pollinator associations and free set of Sisyphus lotus scrub lands. Uh, we use different variables, um, floral visitation assemblages, floral density, pollinator interaction rates, degree of habitat and landscape degradation, and fruit set. So um, this is Europe, um, this is Spain, and this our sampling area is the semi-arid southern of Iberian Peninsula, and uh, is the whole species range in, in Spain. We have three regions, the core region has uh, 11 population. Uh, in this area, we have the um, Cabo de Gata National Park and um, exist um, connection uh, uh, between population more or less. And the West region uh, is the most degraded habitat, uh, mainly due to the greenhouse uh, agriculture. All um, white points are greenhouse. And the East region has uh, six population, this area, and um, the connection between population doesn't exist, and the size of population is very small. Well, field sampling, uh, we choose uh, 20 or 25 uh, individuals per population, and uh, uh, study the taxonomic and functional uh, floral visitors. Uh, we have uh, four features of the habitat the, for the assembly of floral visitor. Uh, we did two visits per population with two, three minute census per individuals. And for, with this data, uh, we calculate the poly pollinator diversity, taxonomic and functional. The floral display, um, we use a, a square sampling um, with this data, uh, with we calculated the flower density. Pollinator interaction rate uh, is defined for floral visitation rates and pollinator visitation rates. And finally, pollinator service, uh, again, with sampling with the, uh, the, the same square that uh, floral display, and calculated the fruit set. It's the maximum number of ripe fruits divided for maximum number of open flowers. For the Characterization of habitat, uh, well, um, we are going to focus first in this picture. In this, uh, we have the, the point, the yellow point, half individuals, and we have um, a buffer surrounded of 15 meters. In this picture, we have a minimum perimeter area surrounding all individuals in our population. And finally, in this picture, we have a 1.5 kilometer uh, ba uh, radius buffer surrounding the minimum perimeter area. Uh, landscape feature, um, we, um, uh, it's defined for land use diversity and natural habitat cover, and we use um, this approximation, 1.5 kilometer radius cycle, and for the habitat retina degradation um, is defined by three principal components uh, based in site population and patchiness, and for the patchiness we use this approximation with the 15 meter radius buffer. 
well, result, um, we find that fine functional groups represent the 16% of assemblage uh, in all population. Uh, these groups are uh, altruistic flies, small collector bees, diving ants, large collector bees, and large collector wasps. Um, here we have a cluster in this, uh, about the assemblage of floral visitors. Uh, we can see that there, there not exceeds any um, grouping pattern. Uh, we have a population of different regions mixed in all branches. And this result, it's similar uh, that Permanova say, we have significant result in population within region, but not among regions. Here we have a variance partitioning. We have that for pollinator visitation rate, flower visitation rate, fruit set, and flower density exceeds significant um, result um, between plants and with, with between population, but not among regions. Here we have a conceptual model we, um, uh, where all possible uh, interaction between our variables, we have uh, two simple variables, pollinator service is the fruit set and flower density is the number of, flo of flower uh, study with the square sampling. And then we have four variables, grouping variables, pollinator interaction rate was defined for pollinator visitation rate and flower visitation rate. Habitat random was defined for the three principal components. Landscape uh, was defined for natural habitat cover and land use diversity. And pollinator diversity was defined for functional and um, taxonomic um, diversity. We did our regression models and um, this our six variables, and this is the possible interaction uh, with significant results. And with this result, the, our model looks like this. It's more simpler, and the patch one, two, six, seven, eight was excluded after, but while removal multiple, multiple regression. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if we represented the total effects, uh, of each um, interaction, uh, we have that pollinator diversity don't have a um, significant result on the fruit set, but uh, habitat random has significant effect on the fruit set mediated by pollinator interaction rate, and this is the total effect of this variable. But the vari variable with the most effect on the fruit set was the landscape. Landscape uh, mediated the, um, uh, the effect uh, for flower density and pollinator interaction rate. And 0.52 is the value of total effect of this variable. And this model explained the 72% um, of the fruit set variance and is a good fit. Finally, uh, our conclusion was um, Tithifus lotus uh, has a, is a generalized plant with five major functional groups, uh, both functional and taxonomic composi composition and diversity of visitor assemblages vary among population, but not among regions. Variation in pollinator visitation rate, flora visitation rate, fruit set, and flower density are found between individuals and population. Pollinator interaction rate was the approximate determinant of, of fruit set, and the effect of anthropogenic disturbance on fruit set are mediated by their influence on flower density and pollinator interaction rates. So our final conclusion uh, is that habitat random and especially landscape degradation are affecting plant pollinator association and fruit set of Cicifus lotus. Um, uh, we say that Cicifus is a keystone species, so pay attention to both scale of management should be done for conservation this threatened European ecosystem. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, I, I try to <laughs> understand your question.
Yeah, that's a great study. Just a curiosity. Did you observe facilitation among plants? Among plants? Yeah, like uh, some small annual plants that is growing mainly or only beneath Sisyphus. Uh, well, um, I, um, I study only Sisyphus, okay, but um, Sisyphus is the plant that facilitates uh, 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 the life of other, but not, not other plants live in this habitat because Sisyphus exists. Um, I think that they are not facilitated to Sisyphus, but... Yeah, like, you know, Paco Pugnaire. Paco Pugnaire. Yeah, 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 he did some studies that, And I was wondering if he, in your plots, there are also those small plants, or if you remove them, or if you just do not consider uh, this effect. We not consider the other plants, but uh, I, I think that there are no interference between, uh, with the pollinator, but um, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thanks. Any more? Sarah or again? <laughs> oh, you keep asking questions, sorry. Uh, do you have any idea how landscape could be affecting floral density, what, what the mechanism of that might be? I need that to repeat again. Uh, sorry. Um, you, it showed that the landscape, the surrounding land use, influenced floral density. And I wondered if you had any ideas why that might be happening, what the mechanism of that might be. No, uh, I, I don't know. I, we know that um, the degradation habitat affects the flower density. Um, uh, the other part of the study is uh, about the dispersion, of, but only with Sisyphus. But I'm not sure the other... But it's interesting. <laughs> Any more? Uh, let me ask one then. Um, <laughs> I, not with, I would probably shout that enough. Um, not with some of the fact that you said you didn't look at other species, but do you get any sense that there's a spillover effect of pollinators from your focal species to other species? The, you say that uh, if other species uh, can be affected, the attraction of the pollinators... Yeah, are they benefiting from the fact you've got a, a, a plant that's dragging in lots of pollinators? Yes, uh, the period of the flowering in this plant is very special because uh, the, the weather in this area is uh, it's, it's special. Um, when Sisyphus uh, flowering, there is the, there isn't any species with, with flowers, so they are no competitive for the okay. pollination. So they're absolutely crucial for the pollination. Yes. Okay. Well, just because I saw that we have some minutes more. Basically, in, in your conclusion, you said that Sisyphus is visited by generalist pollinators. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you say that not all visitors are pollinators. No, no. I, I say that the, the generalization of those specializations depends on the degree to what those pollinators are visiting only Sisyphus or all other plants. But you, ah, I think okay. that you don't know if those bees are visiting also other plants. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's difficult. For yes, it's difficult. This year we want to to study more about the generalization with uh, determinate pollinator uh, in Sisyphus, but in this, well, in this summer, uh, not now. Okay, thank you, Linda. Much gracias. <laughs> <laughs> so, our uh, next speaker is uh, Kutcher. Who, uh, Will Schott, who's telling us about root chemistry and how to determine the outcome of novel plant nematode interactions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, and um, I will tell indeed about uh, below ground interactions between range expanding plant species and uh, 
brute feeding nematodes. So we all know that, um, what was this thing doing? Yeah, it works. Uh, that we have uh, temperature, uh, temperature increases, especially in uh, higher latitude areas. And one of the common ecological responses to this is that uh, species uh, originally occurring in the south move up north. So we have uh, latitudinal range expansion of especially plants, but also other animal species. But of course, uh, when we talk about plants, plants of course do not live on their own. Uh, they interact with all sorts of above ground and below ground organisms. And um, in the, in, when you think about range expansion, it's very important to know that not all these organisms might move at the same pace, right? So a nice paper by Matti Berg and colleagues shows that actually above ground uh, organisms might um, uh, expand their range much faster than below ground organisms. And yeah, these or soil organisms especially are really slow and this must, might of course uh, result in a disruption of above ground, below ground interactions. Um, and this is quite, we can, you can draw a parallel between um, species that are introduced from, um, inter uh, so inter uh, intercontinental species introduction, so uh, invasive plant species also, um, tend to leave their soil organisms behind. And this is what we call enemy release. And this is also something uh, what might happen during uh, intracontinental range expansion. Um, and whether, whether these plants are really uh, released from their enemies or whether they really benefit from this enemy release is very likely to depend on the establishment of novel interactions. So when you think of a uh, plant, then the, the uh, plant species in a native, in a new coming in into a new community. Uh, a very important question is how related this plant species or how similar this plant species is to plant species already there in the new community or in its new community. So when a plant species is really uh, similar to the uh, species that are already there, so it probably has uh, a limited, uh, limited difference in uh, biochemistry compared to the native plants, uh, then the novel plant is like very likely to, do, uh, to establish, but it will not become dominant because uh, local herbivores and pathogens will probably be able to attack this plant in its new range. But when a plant has very strongly different uh, biochemistry, then actually two things might happen. Um, local herbivores and pathogens might not be able to cope with this plant and then the plant can become very dominant or uh, the plant does not have the proper defense mechanisms to deal with the herbivores in, it, uh, in its new range, uh, and then it probably might not even establish or become, uh, or becomes very suppressed. And there's quite, there is some evidence for this, uh, especially in invasive plant species, where we see that um, plant species that, or at least successful plants, uh, successful invasive species have more unique chemistry them related plant species already there in this range. And that also leads to, um, uh, uh, leads to lower, um, lower success of the local herbivores on these plants. And why this is interesting in a, uh, also in an intracontinental uh, range expansion um, uh, context is that when you move to the equator, more uh, diverse herbivores and pathogens are present and plants that are coming from uh, or originally uh, live in these areas might have much more di diverse uh, defense mechanisms than plants that live in uh, higher latitude areas where fewer pathogens and herbivores are present. So I wanted to test these ideas in, uh, in, uh, in plant, uh, in below ground uh, plant nematode interactions. And I'm, well, I'm just, every time switching between these two things. <laughs> uh, so uh, we looked at, I wanted to look at host recognition and preference. So we did nematode choice experiments with range expanders and natives. And then we also looked at nematode re reproduction on these plant species. And to back this up, we did root chemistry anal analysis. We looked at the root volatiles and also root, the root metabolome of some species. So we tested three hypotheses. One, native root feeding nematodes um, prefer native, native plant species, that is, over range expanding plant species. Uh, two, uh, nematode attraction corresponds with nematode reproduction. And three, um, the range expanders have more unique root chemistries than related 
native congeners, so na related uh, native plant species. And we use three pairs of uh, native and range dependent plant species, um, a pair of Centauria, a pair of Geranium, and a pair of Roripa. And in red are the species that are currently expanding their range northward. They are, are, are all established uh, in the Netherlands now for some decades. And we use two uh, native generalist nematode species. One is uh, Melodogene, the left one, which is an endoparasite. And on the right, we have Helicotelengus, which is an ectoparasite. And to test nematode choice and preference, we did two types of um, choice experiments. Uh, first in agar, so that's a bit, yeah, it's an unnatural uh, condition, of course, with plants, uh, with nematodes in inoculated in the middle, and then they could either go to the left or the right. And the second one was a bit more natural in f soil filled white tubes with uh, plants growing in the arms, and then we inoculated nematodes in the center. And then we did four types of treatments. Um, we did a control treatment with no plants present to just see whether nematodes would move at all. Uh, and then we looked at nematode attraction with only one plant on one side and nothing on the other. So both with native and range expanding plant species. And then we had the real preference experiment between native and range expanding plant species. So uh, some results to sh uh, show first. So uh, this is nematode attraction. So Nemato uh, the nematodes could move to either the plant or to the control side without plant. And uh, the gray is the, the plant side. And we first look at the first nem uh, the nematode, Melodogene. And then when we look at the native, so the upper tree, we see there, that there is always a strong attraction to the plant. So uh, native plants attract uh, root feeding nematodes. Then we have the, the, the quickly to show the control. In the control, we see that the nematodes actually don't move at all. So that's a nice, uh, yeah, nice observation to see uh, that, that nematodes really need a uh, plant attraction uh, or a plant cue to um, move at all. And then when we look to uh, when uh, when we look at the range expanders first at the lower two, we see that there is nematode attraction, but it's not as strong, or it seems not to be as strong as in the natives. But when when we then look at Centauria, so the range expanded Centauria, we see something really funny because we see that the, uh, the plant is not attracting nematodes but actually repelling them. So there's something funny happening over there. And then when we look at the other nematode, we see more or less the same pattern. Uh, so strong attraction in the natives, not so strong attraction in the, in the uh, lower two range expanders, and uh, at least in one, uh, one uh, experiment we see. Uh, significant uh, rebalance of the nematode by this uh, same range expanding plant species. When we then look at the, the preference, so the, the, here the nematodes could cho really choose between native and range expanding plant species, we see that there's a strong preference for the natives in two out of three uh, plant pairs, so in the Centauria and in the Roripa, and in Geranium there is not so, uh, there's not, the nematodes do not really make a, a choice for either one of the plant species. Then we look at uh, nematode reproduction on these six plant species, and actually uh, we see very similar patterns. We see a very strong difference between uh, range expanding and native centauria with the nematodes, or at least the Melodogene, uh, producing as much as, I think, 10,000 times, uh, or the numbers, nematode numbers were 10,000 times higher in the native than in the range expander, so that's quite a difference, I would say. And then we see a similar but uh, less strong effect in the Roripa. In Geranium, the things are a little bit different. We didn't see a preference pattern there, but uh, we actually now see that nematode numbers are a bit higher in the range expander. Um, in the range expander, yeah. And then we will, when we look at the other nematodes, I think the patterns look fairly similar, although the nematode numbers are just much uh, lower. But uh, at least there is uh, still a significant difference between native and range expanding Centauria. Then we're going to look at uh, root volatiles. So um, I, will I will show you three of these graphs. Uh, in red are the natives, in blue are the range expanders, and in uh, green that's a control, so that's a, a soil without plants growing on it. And what is 
especially interesting is to see how many different, uh, significantly different volatiles there are and um, how many uh, unique volatiles uh, there, uh, there are that, that are produced by the range expander. And we see that in Centauria there are quite some different volatiles and we see that there are more unique volatiles produced by the range expander than by the native. When we then look at the other two pairs, we see much lower, uh, significantly different volatiles between uh, native and range expander, and we don't see um, this pattern of higher volatiles uh, produced in the range expander than in the native. Uh, of course, these unique numbers of unique volatiles are still quite low, so it probably is all has all also has to do with the identity of the volatiles rather than the sheer uh, number of uh, unique volatiles that are produced. So because we, we really like this uh, Centauria pair, um, because of the strong differences in interactions, we also did a, a DART analysis, which is direct analysis in real time with this fancy equipment. Um, and um, we see more or less the same pattern. So this is uh, a different um, metabolites produced by the plants. And we see that in Centauria too, with the range expander, we have more um, unique volatiles produced by the uh, by this plant than by the native plant. So there's only four uh, unique volatiles produced uh, by the native and nine by the range expander. So there, there, there seems to be a pattern in, in more unique uh, metabolites produced by this range expanding plant species. So to summarize this, when we, uh, show, uh, um, when we look back at our hypotheses, uh, native root feeding nematodes prefer natives over range expanders. We find that in two out of three cases, but no, and there was no preference in the third. Um, we see that nematode uh, attraction really corresponds with nematode reproduction, so it's quite a, yeah, uh, the one predicts the other quite well, I would say. Um, but we didn't find ev evidence for, for the, uh, for the uh, unique or the number of unique metabolites produced by uh, range expanders. Uh, so in two out of three cases, we didn't find that uh, the range vendor produced more unique volatiles than uh, the native. And um, yeah, as a point of discussion, I think more refined phylogenetic approaches uh, may reveal which range, expand, uh, which range expanding species have a really different uh, uh, root metab uh, metabolome and therefore might really strongly affect uh, local communities. And with that, I want to thank my collaborators uh, especially Giulio Pereira, with, who did quite a lot of the work. Paulina Garbeva is really into the root uh, chemistry stuff, and Wim van der Putt is my supervisor. And for that, I want to thank the other people for some technical assistance and moral assistance and stuff, uh, stuff like that. And you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for a quick question. Hi, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, I don't know how you sampled your volatile organic compounds from your roots, but could it also be not just a case of novel compounds, but also differences in levels of the similar compounds produced between your range expanders and your natives? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, what I showed in this uh, volatile, uh, uh, volatile scheme, uh, that there's actually, so there were 21 significantly different volatiles, of which only yeah. a few were solely produced by one or, one or the other. So the other ones differ in uh, levels, and actually most of them are higher in the range spender than okay. in the native. So there's quite w some. Would yeah. you plan to test those volatiles on the nematodes in terms of? Yeah, we're actually doing things. that. You but do. the, the thing is that um, yeah, nematodes seem to, re uh, yeah, re seem to respond to the whole blend of volatiles. And, and then it becomes really different to pinpoint a uh, single volatile that is uh, doing the trick. Yeah. Thank yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So, our final speaker, who drew the shortest talk with the last talk of the session, Sharon Zatinska, who will tell us about genetic interactions and how they drive Mexican community species associations in the plant aphid system. Thank you very much. So I want to talk about some work we've been doing um, the last few years. Um, a lot's been done by a couple of PhD students of ours. So Mary Clancy's done a lot of the chemical work and Matthias Senf, um, actually a lot of the field work. 
And this is kind of my little area that I can do myself on genetics, because genetics is cool and aphids are cool, so we get them together and it's very awesome. So a lot of my work is very much based on species interactions. So species interact, and this really influences um, the outcome of interactions with other things, uh, community and ecosystem dynamics. I'm sure no one's really gonna uh, argue with me about this. There are two areas of um, kind of ecology that really look at species interactions, but in two different ways. So the first is com uh, community genetics. It's really looking at the genetics of species interactions and the kind of ecological consequences of these, so within species variation. Then we have meta-community um, ecology, so it's really looking at these kind of spatial dynamics, looking at how, like kind of fragmented uh, habitats and how the spatial layout of your populations are really influencing um, how the communities are interacting and how they're limited by dispersal, and that's influencing all the different processes. So in my area, I really try and bring these two together to see well, how we could really kind of make meta-community genetics, bringing really um, meta-community ecology into looking at within species variation and how that influences all the interactions that are going along. So they're really asking these two different questions. So one is within species variation, meta-community ecology is bringing in this spatial aspect. They're both really good, but they're both also lacking in a lot of areas. The so community genetics, yes, genotype explains a lot of things, but we don't really look at dispersal very often. We maybe also don't really look too much at temporal variation. Meta-community ecology then will come and ask much more about these sort of things that's lacking in community genetics, but in meta-community ecology, quite often, even though we know patch quality changes, things like within species variation is very rarely um, addressed in this area. So my main question on this is, well, can genetic interactions among species affect insect plant meta-community dynamics? This is what the whole of this project was about. We have uh, what I think is a really nice system to actually be studying these. So to look at meta-community ecology, obviously we need a patchily distributed plant and our tansy, tanacetum vulgar, gare here, which you'll see with the nice yellow flowers, does produce these patches in a field, there's a patch here and a patch here, separated by grasses, so that's our unsuitable habitat. On this plant are actually three specialized aphids, I'm just gonna focus on one, Metapyrum. It um, only pretty much feeds on this one plant species, it will not feed on the grasses in between, so we really do have this spatial separation. The aphids will, um, produce only dispersal morphs are about generations two to four. So we have nice dispersal at the beginning of the season and then later on they have wingless forms and they're staying on whichever plant that they've been left on at the beginning. We did a big field study in 2014. This is basically just our system. So we have aphids, they're also tended by our ants. That's our mutualist in the system. The aphids are, um, they have parasoid wasps and also predators come along and eat them and then they die, and then our plant at the bottom. What we find is we have very standard dynamics across our whole field sites. This is one single field site of approximately sort of 20 meters by 100 meters. We're looking very fine scale um, dynamics here. We have this dotted line is the percentage of plants that have aphids, so we're getting to around about only 40% of our population, uh, our plants actually have colonized by aphids. At the beginning, we have lots of high colonization. The yellow is when our winged aphids are around, then they drop off. We get predators coming along and we get some extinctions of our individual plant patches. And across the season, we get some recolonization where this extinction happened and then they're recolonized by um, new aphids. So this is our field site map over here and each dot is a single plant and the red ones are the ones that we had aphids on um, in the middle of the season, so you can see they're nicely spread out across, we actually don't have any clustering. Leading this to be a really nice system to be asking, well, how is um, variation in the system really influencing these interactions? So what do we know so far, before I go on further, looking at within species variation? We know ants are important for these aphids. This graph here is the probability a plant will be colonized, so we looked at it weekly, with either Lazius niger or Mimica rubra, and this gray is when the ants are absent the week before aphid colonization. This is when ants were being, or ants were patrolling the plants, so there's no aphids on the plant, they're wandering around, and the next week the chance that we'll have an aphid colony. 
as the ants really are increasing the probability of colonization success, so then required by our aphids. We also um, know that predators can drive aphid colonies to extinction, but this only happens actually when the colony is already small, which is what we can see here, the probability the plant will go extinct, and then along here we have aphid abundance, and the two lines, basically, this is just um, when there's lots of predators around, and this line is when there's not so many predators. Not so many predators, very rarely, they can actually drive a whole aphid colony to extinct, so a colony is on one patch, one plant. When we have lots of predators and you have low aphid abundance, yeah, most of the time, the next week, that plant will become extinct. So not everything is actually being explained by ants or by predators, which has previously been thought that there's a lot of top-down Everything goes extinct because predators come along and eat the aphids. So my question then was, well, if they're only driving them to extinction when it's already small, what's making an aphid population small? So then we have, obviously, low aphid population growth rate. There can be a whole number of different reasons why we have low numbers of aphids. They could have longer developmental time, low fecundity, reduced survival, lifespan. And also this emigration. We may have um, sort of mass effects where you're having rescuing aphids coming in and repopulating our plant. So my next question then was, well, okay, I like my within-species genetic variation. Do we have variation in our plants? And also, what's the role of aphid genetic variation? Previous work, we know that there's high diversity, um, genetic diversity in these aphids, so are we seeing some interesting interactions here? How is this being mediated by the ants and the predators that we know are already having some effect? Our tansy plants are very highly chemically diverse. This has also some genetic basis. This is what we're now describing as our um, genetic effect. And we chemotyped our plants. This has just recently been published, this work, um, freely downloadable. Go to that web um, address. We use two different methods to look at the chemotype of our plant. First of all, we use these twisters, which look at the headspace volatiles given out by the plant. So we just wrapped the plants in bags, put these little uh, twisters in, and collected the, yeah, collected the um, in, induced um, compounds and those that are emitted by the plant. Then we also looked at full uh, leaf extraction using hexane, which takes basically everything that's in the leaf. Then we did an overlap of these and decided to just look at those that were putatively emitted from storage glands. So Tansy has these special uh, trichomes that store these kind of essential oils. We weren't interested in those that were um, induced by herbivore feeding or those that were in the rest of the plant. So we just looked at these ones in the middle or that were overlapping. What we found, we found 22 um, compounds that we could get detect in these and then we just very simply clustered our plants into different um, kind of chemotype classes. And here we have nine that are separated quite nicely. And if we just look at which aphids, which plants are being colonized by aphids at the beginning of the season, these guys over here are much highly colonized. Almost 50% of those plants will have aphids. Whereas these guys, less than 20% of these plants are colonized by aphids. So we see some very obvious effects of chemotype variation at the start. Then I wanted to go and look at the aphid genetic variation. So we genotyped our aphids at 18 microsatellite loci. We actually did this work over two years, and we ended up with 349 aphids. Because aphids are sexually, uh, asexually reproducing, we just took one aphid per colony. So for every colony of aphids, we just have one sample. They were, again, as we expected from previous work on this, they're highly genetically diverse. So we actually had a lot of singleton multi locus genotypes. That's something I also want to explore, is why do we have such high diversity in these aphid species. These clustered into six main genotype groups. You can see the result from structure. So each column here will be um, one aphid, and due to the microsatellites, they just separate them into their likely groups. What we did next, we uh, simply um, looked at how many of the aphids from each genotype cluster were found on the plants in their chemotype cluster. So you can't really see probably the numbers here. It doesn't matter so much, but these are the observed numbers, and in brackets are the expected numbers. And highlighted are those um, 
associations between the plant chemotype class and the aphid genotype that we found to be more or less um, than expected um, from a random distribution. Here, this is the only cluster we found where these genotypes were less often on this, and all of these ones are found more often than expected. And some very strong ones down here where aphid group uh, six, very, very highly, pretty much only found on this particular chemotype class. So the question is, well, what's driving these associations? Is it the most abundant chemicals? This is what I get asked all the time. Well, there's dominant chemicals. That's obviously the thing that's driving this effect. No, it's really not. This graph shows um, from some Bayesian uh, model averaging. Up here, the posterior effect probability is basically uh, the method runs a whole load of models, and it sees when these particular chemical pump compounds down here are retained in the model. And so this is the percentage of models where it's retained. So we have eucalyptal and beta terpeniol are quite highly retained in there, so they're having the most effect on our aphid genetic structuring. And then the line here is showing the concentration of these chemicals in our plants. And you can see from that, we have no correlation. It's not the most dominant chemicals that are having the strongest effect on our aphids. Okay, last result slide, we also explored our effect of our ants and our predators using some uh, variance partitioning. So you just put all this into a GLM with our covariates of plant size and aphid number and all these things um, that we were also looking at. And we find here again what we expected, this big effect of plant chemotype class. Something I was uh, maybe not expecting so much is to find a three-way interaction between the plant chemotype and both of our ant species. Now these ant species, we actually find some competitive exclusion in the field, and we think maybe that's mediating this, these interactions here. So we had a look to see where the aphids, uh, where the ants were most likely, this is this graph here, and basically above here is kind of preferred chemotypes of the plant, they're found more often on these, and down here, less preferred, they're not found very often. And we can see that the dark, one dark bars are Lazius. There's a few um, chemotype classes of plant that really are found quite often on. And some Mimica, we do not find on these at all. Looking a little bit more into the um, interactions here, we find that plant uh, 3.1, so this is one over here, actually the interaction between or the association between this plant chemotype class and our aphids from cluster 6 is ant dependent. When there are no ants, we do not find this association, but when ants are present, we do find this strong association. Another interaction between 4.1 and aphid 6, numbers don't matter, was enhanced. So without ants, we still saw this, this association. With ants, it was even stronger. So there's definitely some mediation um, going on between these. There was no actual effect of predators on aphid genetic cluster, um, but there was some other influence of chemotype on predator I really don't have time to go through. So in summary, we really find that these tansy aphids show this really fine scale population genetic structuring in this single field site. It was stable over the two years of data collection, so we really think maybe there's some evolutionary uh, consequence or influence on this. Plant chemical variation is influencing the distribution of our aphids across our field. Maybe this is helping to maintain the high genetic diversity that we see in our aphids. Our ants are really uh, benefiting. They're not just increasing colonization success, but also the aphid genotype distribution, and maybe this is mediated by the preference of the ants. So while predators don't affect the distribution of aphids, all these other things can influence the actual population size. Once it's below about 30 aphids, predators can come in and drive that to extinction. So my take home message is mutualistic ants can enhance plant chemotype, aphid genotype interactions, uh, associations in our meta-community system. And thank you to the DFG for funding all this and all the people that did field work. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we've got time for a quick question. Hi, uh, um, nice presentation. Um, so. You looked at aphid genotypes. Did you look at aphid secondary symbionts at all? 
Um, I have done. Actually, they have uh, three symbionts. I don't think there's a lot of effect. Um, one symbiont, only one or two aphids have them. I think that's maybe Seratia. And the other two, like, they pretty much all have them. They all have Wolvachia. They all have Regiella or whatever, the okay. other one. So, yeah, I don't think that's mediating anything, okay. unfortunately, because that would be awesome. <laughs> That was a very nice talk, Sharon. Um, I was wondering what the core, if there was a correlation between the chemical communities that repelled, well not repelled, but had fewer aphids on them, those plants, and the ants. Did you see, did you look at that to see were the ants also repelled by those plants? Repelled so is was, not the right word. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are the ones that actually, hang on, is this the, these are the ones that repelled the aphids more. And you can see actually Lazius here is really not repelled by either. And that's the one that's enhancing this association. So aphids are repelled, but as soon as the ants are there, they really keep the aphids. So there's something different going on on those two. Actually, we're doing a lot of preference performance experiments at the moment in the greenhouse to really tease apart what it really is. That's, is it aphid preference? Is it ant preference? Yeah. So watch this space. <laughs> and one final one at the back. I'm wondering what the, within this system, how far can the aphids disperse? I mean, is every plant essentially available to them or is there clustering in terms of where they can disperse to? Yep, so um, when they have the winged form, essentially every plant is available to them. But then as soon as they lose their winged form, which is after like, yeah, they only have like two weeks of the year where we have these winged forms. So the rest of it, they're pretty much stuck. We do have, um, we've looked at this, we've got a paper under review and hopefully accepted soon that's really looking at this. And they will move, but it's very localized. It's like if the plant is nearby, they get to it. But we, from doing the, field, uh, the greenhouse experiments, we know that even if a plant is this far away, they can just stand there and stand there and then they just and die. So they're actually pretty terrible at dispersing. So, yeah. So yeah, no when they wind have wind form, they can even disperse like kilometers. Yeah. We think they should be able to. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank.